everyone. Welcome back to Relative Pitch 2023. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Happy New Year to everyone. We hope it's been easy transitioning back into the new year after the beautiful break. As long as it, it wasn't as long as we needed, but it's okay. We'll get there. We'll have more. Um, well, we are very excited to have an amazing special guest for our first episode of the season, or sorry, this season of 2023. Um, Dr. Brittany Trotter, who is the Assistant Professor of Flute and Program Director of Woodwinds at the University of Pacific's Conservatory of Music. Dr. Trotter, or Brittany, as we are going to call you today, how are you? Welcome. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on your podcast. Oh my God, you guys are just wonderful people. And so I'm going to really enjoy just chatting with you all. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, like, it feels weird to call you Brittany, but I will because it's okay. But like, <laughs> I'm, I'm being serious because like I, whenever I was first growing up, I did not see a lot of black flute players and especially not a lot who had university postings, who are doing so many competitions as you who, and then you, I mean, seriously, like it's like you're everywhere doing everything. So you were one of the first <laughs> like beacons I saw going, oh wait, we can do that? Like they're they're allowing us into these spaces now or like, you know what I mean? Cause it's never the fact that we couldn't, but it was where we were allowed. And um, so you were one of my biggest like inspirations just starting off in where I am. And so first of all, just thank you for being, <laughs> thank you for <laughs> existing. Yes. Yeah, that's, thank you. And like a lot of that have to do with people giving me opportunity to sign. And one thing that I strive in my career is to give people those same opportunities. So if I'm in the door, I'm bringing in as many people as I can in that, that door. Yes. I love yep. that. And that's a part of it that people don't talk about enough is like when you are there, like let's bring people in. But before we jump onto that, I just want to give everyone more context about who you are and the amazing journey you've had and how you've ended up to where you are today. So please let's, let's hear about this amazing journey. Uh, uh, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so to start off, um, I am originally from Mississippi, um, South Mississippi, to be exact. So South. Um, right. Yeah. Southern. My hometown oh. is Laurel, Mississippi. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, very small, like, town. Like, we don't even have a Target. Um, I went home last summer, and we just um, got a Starbucks in our town. Oh. That's, big, that's big news. That's big news. <laughs> um, but a lot of like my career have to, I have to like start with my band director. I had an amazing high school, junior high, elementary school band director. Um, her name is Tamika Bridges. She is just amazing. She was, um, she's a black woman and just to see her do what she does and have that passion for music really helped me to like go on in my career oh yeah and another person that I have to thank so much is my first flute teacher Mary Newell um she was or yeah she was the um flute professor at the community college that was like 10 minutes away from my home mm -hmm. um, and she really believed in me because um my band director first introduced me to her and as I was talking to her as she was talking with my parents I were like we don't have that much money to pay for lesson and she gave me lessons from eighth grade to 12th grade um, for like $12 an hour until wow. I got like a job to pay her her full rate so <laughs> that is an opportunity right there that's awesome that is awesome seriously yeah um yeah, and then so I did my undergrad at the University um, of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Um, and I had this great mentors, all of my professors there. I um, initially went in as a music ed major. And it wasn't until my um, last year of my freshman year, I had a long conversation with my professor. And he was like, you know, I actually see you doing performance. And that was the first time someone like told me that. And I was like, okay, so I went down to the music office and then I added a performance major. So 
my bachelor's, I have both in education and performance. Wow. And as I was navigating, like I wanted to go to grad school, I know that I wanted to do something both teaching and both performing. And so I was talking to the pursuit professor, Derek, and I was like, hey, I want to do these two things. Um, and I think the best way to do that is to be a college professor like you. So what is your advice <laughs> um, that you have for me to get to the level yeah. that you are? And the one thing that she said was, just go straight through grad school. And I was like, okay, let me figure out a way to get to grad school for free. Um, because of course, get your coin. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was so lucky enough to get a graduate assistantship at the University of Wyoming, um, and I loved it there. Um, and I think one of the main reasons I wanted to go to Wyoming because, I mean, being from the South, as you guys know, like, you know, you, we love the South, but sometimes we have to get away from the South. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this is true. And so my big thing was, okay, what are schools that I can really get away from the South? And Wyoming yeah. is night and day yeah i bet literally yeah mm -hmm. but it was a fantastic um my just a graduate assistant sit there um my professor is one of my biggest friends and mentors to this day um mm -hmm. so he really like you know gave me the straight up advice that like you know this path that you're on is not easy there are going to be times where you want to give up but like you know just know what is your passion and just go forth to get it you receive a lot of no's but you also will receive yes so mm -hmm. just keep trudging on yep. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and so after i finished my master's at the university of wyoming i went to west virginia university where i got like a full fellowship which really helped me um financially because I was able to really just concentrate on my studies and on my flute playing. And even then, um, halfway through completing my um, DMA, um, I was able to move to Pittsburgh, which is about like an hour and, and a half away and really like get settled into like breaking into the scene there, the, mm. new scene, the classical scene. And so that really helped me become secure. Um, so one of my biggest thing is like, you know, we are, if you're in school now and like you're absorbing everything that your university has to offer and please do like absorb everything, but also take time to absorb everything in the communities outside. Because like, you know, one of the biggest thing is we have to make a living somehow um, and provide for ourselves. And so the biggest thing that I like give my students is yes, you're going to absorb everything here, but also look out for opportunities elsewhere. So you can set yourself up yep. thinking like, Oh my God, what I'm going to do next. Cause for me, I didn't have an option to go back to my parents' house. They were like, y'all go, y'all grown, get out my house. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so that was a driving force. I was just like, okay, um, I need to, Figure out right. get some money. Yeah, you gotta stay out of my parents' house because I they love me to death. Don't get me wrong, but you know they are just like we welcome that emptiness. -ness. <laughs> <laughs> we like we like sleeping. We like calmness. No talking. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so I was able to like freelance in Pittsburgh, which was really great because. I was able to really bring in my two passions of teaching and performing. Um, I was able to be a teaching artist at a lot of nonprofits. Um, that's where I got involved with um, the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust, where I went mm. and um, gave workshops to K-4. Um, mm. I was able to be a music teacher at a Waldorf school. I was able to have a large private studio of um, like at the very like peak of it I had like 35 students um wow. teaching weekly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and then I was able to have so many different opportunity because Pittsburgh is such uh, a great town where they really put money into the arts and so I was able to apply for grants get these different opportunities play along with some one of the top players in Pittsburgh and take lessons with the players of the Pittsburgh Symphony um, so I really, that, it was very odd to me 
in a sense, because I'm just like, okay, this town has so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I was meeting the right people and networking mm -hmm. with the right people to get into these opportunities and stuff. Um, and then um, the pandemic happened and I was still teaching um, and applying. And I got this wonderful job at the University of Pacific that I absolutely enjoyed. The faculty and the students are just superb um, there. And so it's just, I don't know, I'm counting my blessings every day. And I bet like you're all the way, you've just been moving all around the United States. Yeah. Uh, like what, it, like, uh, first of all, how can you move to all these places? I mean, they, I'm pretty sure they're gorgeous. I mean, the, I know Mississippi, I know Pittsburgh, and I know California is gorgeous, but like how the transition between all of those, how do you, how do you keep saying through all of that? You know, one of the biggest reasons why I got into music was um, I made all state band all the way through high school. And each year in all state band, we get to go to these big cities. I went to New York for the first time in Boston, mm -hmm. um, in Chicago. And I'm just like, being from the South and like my parents travel, but we stay within the South. Like the furthest we ever went as a family was like Mobile, Alabama or <laughs> New Orleans. Yep. Uh, and like, you know, you can like, there's even like articles that like talk about like why specifically the black community kind of that lives in the South kind of stay close knit in the South and don't travel as much. Right. And so for me to have those opportunities to see, oh, my God, there is a world outside. There are people who get me. Um, yes. um, there's people to meet. There's like experiences to have. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted that. Again, being from the South and especially since high school, I was like, I want to get away from Mississippi right. <laughs> and experience the world. <laughs> so um, just traveling back and forth is just I I absolutely enjoy it because like I have the mental and physical capacity to do so and I'm going to do that as mm -hmm. much as I can. So when I become 90 or 100, God, you know, willing right. to allow me to live that long, I can look back at my life and say, hey, I, I went for it and I, I had so many great experiences. Mm. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I want to go back just a little bit to how much I relate to you with your roots of I had such an amazing um, high school or middle and high school band director who was the inspiration for me wanting to to be in music. And he was the person who also introduced me to my private lesson teacher who tr changed the trajectory, I think, of, of who like my career and what I wanted to be. Um, and I don't think that's talked about enough when people make it big, big is like going back and saying, it was all because I decided to pick up a random instrument in a random day, you know, you know, in middle school and wanted to play this. And this person pushed me and had no idea probably what I was going to become or who I could become. And, and you look back now and I'm like, think about how many people they have inspired and put out into the world. So, like, first of all, music educators, educators in general thank you. You are not thanked enough. You are not given enough ever. We'll never be given enough. But from your students, we say thank you because we yes. literally would not be here without you. Yes. Really. Even for the even for the ones who wanted to be in gym instead, but we got thrown in the band class, we still thank you because that was me. I wanted to be in gym because they play, they play basketball and dodgeball. There's too many people in gym. So I got thrown in band. <laughs> Crazy. And what about you, Anthony? What's your story? Oh, well, I chose it. See, music, <laughs> music was in my family. And I, I couldn't wait to get to middle school to finally, because I was in a little elementary choir and it was fine. But when I it actually got to be a class that I'm like, I get to do this every day, sign me up. So um, mm -hmm. I still talk to all of my music teachers and I tell them how thankful I am. And now that I've, I've taught middle and high school already, so I'm on the opposite side of this. And now students are coming to me and is saying, Mr. Morris, like, thank you for, for seeing something in me. And it's funny because you uh, you just said you the teacher probably didn't know. You're right. We don't know. We, we really don't. We're just like, here, play this because, you know, we need this right now. But who yep. knows? But it, it, and that says something about teachers is that 
yeah, the student falls in love with, you know, the idea, but it's the teacher. There's something special about your teacher, that connection you make. And which brings me to my question of representation matter. You had a African-American woman band director. In Mississippi. In Mississippi, which is... Which is still very a minority, even, I mean, being Black and, and being a band director is already small, but being a Black woman is even smaller. That was like a goal. I'm pretty sure it was a gold mine for you. And, and please talk about that. Oh, like, definitely. And like, C, like, the one thing that I loved about her is that C did not, like, get crap, like, mm-hmm. like, you know. C didn't was like if you give crap to her, she was not having it. Like you know, Uh know, that the line, and I, and to have that kind of influence and to see like, oh, I don't have to be quiet and kelped and like say you know my, like, but I can be like, I can have my own mind and say it and Mm -hmm. not be afraid to speak it. That was super powerful, and so like. For me, like I, I have a whole like um, bookmark of like YouTube videos of powerful Black women giving motivational speech, like mm-hmm. Issa Rae or Angela Bassett or Viola Davis. Like, and I listen every time that I get down on myself and just like, oh, maybe I sort of spoken up about it. Like, I look back at those inspirational speeches and feel like, okay, to say that yes, as a Black woman, I am allowed to have space. I, um, I don't have to bring myself down a notch. Like, you know. That is super powerful. So I'm I'm mm-hmm. very thankful to have that kind of representation at a very early age. Your foundation it was just set, you know, by that. Um, and I love how you, I can already see it. You are that teacher who inspires your students and people that are not even your students like us who are just like, yes, look at how she's succeeding. I, I want to be like that. So it, it's just beautiful to see. This well, the cycle never stops. It doesn't. And it's, for me, it's it's funny because we've been interviewing people now. This is our third season. Yeah. Yeah, it's our third season. Um, I am a co-host. I swear I know what we do. <laughs> um, but it's funny because we have subconsciously interviewed a lot of people from the South. Huh. And a lot of people from Georgia, too, like spe- like specifically at times. And it's hilarious because, like, I left from Kennesaw and went to Michigan for grad school. So I had to get out of the South. I don't know about you living in Wyoming and then, like, over there, West Virginia. Do you miss the snow? Because I miss the snow. You know, at times I do miss the snow. Okay. I want to make sure I'm the only Southerner. I get my car out of the snow. But I do miss, like, the first snow in the crunching of your, your feet. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. That. And then the bundling up and then just yep. walking the snow that's like falling your yeah. face. But <laughs> okay. the cleaning and digging my car, no. No. And almost the car not almost starting. Yeah, that whole thing. Oh, yeah. But yeah, so, but like, it's funny because like a lot of people that I like see like in Michigan was like trash talk in the South because they're just like, oh, it's the South, like all these things. And I'm like, y'all like, there's like gold mines of people like where you grew up is like, it might not be like, if you didn't get that break by the lesson teacher who was like, you know what? I see your raw talent and I see your willingness to work. I'm going to just teach you and you can give me what you can give me because I know I see that in the South. There's a lot of these like hardworking people that then go make it. And I'm just like, it's always amazing when we get on this podcast. You're like, from Mississippi, when I read that, I was like, there's another one. Check the box. Come on, let's go. We got another one in the arsenal. What are we doing now? It's just awesome to see. And I just like the spirit of the South, I feel like, you know, this it's grit. It's perseverance. It is. Mm-hmm. They get through the South. Good and, cooking. Yeah. And like, for me, like, I... <laughs> Not the dog on the South, as I was saying I, earlier, I wanted to get away from the South. Yeah. But like a lot of what I am has is because I'm a Southern woman and I'm super proud to be a Southern woman mm-hmm. um, with that. So, I mean, and this, the experience of like moving around across the United States and seeing like the different cultures of that, mm-hmm. like, you know, 
I'm very thankful for my upbringing. Yes. Um, and it's it's always so interesting when we do meet people and have them on the podcast and feel and we're like, oh, you're a Southerner too. And then we see how it shapes a lot of their career and the things they do as like professional development. So because you also with that with your passions of um, performance and education are an amazing like administrator and, and presenter and these uh, all these other amazing things that you have in your bag. And one of your biggest, latest things, um, I would say, is your like presentation at NFA, Flute and Hip Hop. Um, that was the first of all, I feel like I, we, we talked about this when we had um, um, Ashley Crawford on as well, but mm -hmm. I the room was stuffed. Y'all should have, first of all, you should have had a bigger room because there were so many people who were lined up in there trying to get in like it, it the environment was charged like it felt like honestly especially all the black people who were in the front too i was like this feels like church wait a minute like let me get my ties and offering now like it, it, it was such a warm welcoming environment and, and again it like it felt like home being in that environment with with you all felt like home. And I think that is another added element of, of you know, where we all have come from and our different experiences. Can you speak to how your your upbringing maybe helped with shaping that presentation specifically? Well, here's the thing. So my upbringing, um, my father is a preacher. So I grew up with nothing but church music. Now we were allowed to listen to it, but like not at a loud level because, you know, that's not what my parents would like at right. that. But just again, just my my high school, I graduated with about like 90 people and mm -hmm. over 90% of those people were black. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just a cultural thing, even working at like parties and like, you know, talking. So like for me, like I have always had this like upbringing of hip hop, especially Southern hip hop, This is the basis of hip hop today. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like hip hop today is just a, a like Atlanta trap mm -hmm. plus Chicago drill. Mm -hmm. And that makes up like the most popular, like, you know, if we listen to Drake or something like that, yeah. we, that's what we're getting, this like trap and drill music. Mm -hmm. so You're right. and, and so I grew up in, the best era to be in the South and listening to hip hop music because like, I remember like middle school, like juvenile, back that ass up. Like that was like the biggest thing <laughs> of like- yes! That's my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and even being, I was so close to New Orleans is really just three hours away. So that bounced music. Oh, so yep. like, I remember in um, undergrad seeing Big Frida live performing. Come on, I, when people talk about Little Rain, I'm just like you, like from the hot boards. Like I would like. Yes, yes. But I feel like my upbringing of the early 2000s, because that was really the like you know epitome of like the South have something to mm -hmm. say, and yep. so I'm able to um, just my experience with that. I'm able to just do so much with that, and then of course like with the flute. Like for me whenever I play my instrument, I'm playing from my soul, like, you know. Um, and so I, when I'm doing my warmups or anything, like I try to incorporate music that I'm listening to currently in my lone tones and stuff, because like, I want to emulate that sound. So like, if I'm doing lone tones, I might listen to Aretha Franklin and see if I can match her vibrato or mm -hmm. like Whitney Houston or something. If I'm practicing articulation, I listen to like my favorite, like, Buster Rhymes because like he just rhymes so fast and see if I can mm -hmm. match my double tongue with that. Mm -hmm. And so like it's just these little things. I'm just like, okay, I admire this song because of this. How can I put it into yeah. my profession and melt that together? Because that's what you know what we should be doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Facts. I can we first take a second to just I, I just realized that as soon as you said you're a preacher's daughter, I'm also a PK as uh, well. Like, and so, and I have all, a lot of other friends as well, black women specifically who are preacher's daughters from the South. And I'm like, what is this? What is this happening? Like, what, what, why does this keep showing up every single time? 
And it's just so interesting. I'm like, that, that's a dissertation. Whoever wants to grab that out in the world, that's, whoever, a, dissertation. that's a dissertation. Find that. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. Oh, well, um, you were talking about like you grew up with the uh, the the burst of the South, like really cutting a tie between the East and West Coast battle and making a name for itself. Um, while I was in grad school, um, every paper that I wrote, you can ask Anthony, ask Lauren, because me and Anthony would stay on the phone for because Anthony is our resident like Rolodex of all that I stuff. Music. When I like, say I came from a music family, like and, all of that music was playing. Yeah. So I know it all. Mm -hmm. And he just knows it. And it's not even and I'm over here, like I'm like, okay. I, I'm just analyzing it. Like Outcast has always been one of my favorite people. So every paper I wrote was about Outcast, like the rise of hip hop in Atlanta with Outcast, the evolution of Outcast, how the South has influenced the rest of the rap. Like every paper I wrote was about Outcast. And one of my brothers was like, why? I said, because I miss Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And y'all have to thank Atlanta for a lot of things. Triplets, Migos, bam. they go. You taught them. Like, that's it. And it's funny because, um, do you know Regina, Dr. Regina Bradley? I'm not familiar. So she is considered like in the ethnomusicology world a little bit of like one of the most foremost uh, outcast scholars right now. She's almost released her second book. Um, I have one of her books and she teaches at Kennesaw State University. She was an English professor while we were there and we didn't even know this. And it's funny how one building over, we have someone who's writing musicologist works and our music faculty never even knew it. Oh. And we're right here, like literally right across the street from each other. Am I right, y'all? Right yeah. across the street. Yeah. And it's hilarious. And she's from Albany, Georgia. Like, and she goes home every weekend. She sees her folks. Like she's doing all this stuff. And it's like, uh, when you mentioned that, I was like, Dr. Regina Bradley, got to give her a shout out. Please go buy her books. Like Outcast is amazing. She's written all our forwards. I think she even gave a keynote speech at one of the recent musicologist like uh, conferences, like last year. And so, yes, but yes, low plug. And I feel like in what we do, because we are classical musicians, we went to the the schools to get these degrees, but <laughs> our culture is never talked about in any of these degrees. Our music is not talked about in any of these degrees. So when I when I see like flute and hip hop, I'm like, well, yeah, there's a lot of hip hop music that, since the dawn of hip hop and and its genres before hip hop that included all types of instruments. So yes, it's not like our culture is so far apart. It is that this this society uh, that is of the majority, I would say, in classical mm -hmm. music, they've decided that our culture is something less than. But I will tell you, um, some of the rhythms that are in hip hop music, some classical musicians could never read them rhythms, okay? Some, read them. some of the vocal techniques that your gospel singers use, your R&B singers, so, what, classical singers look to that as something. So it's like our culture, instead of it being mutually exclusive, should be really, we need to bridge that gap. And I'm so glad that y'all y'all did that presentation uh, because Lauren came back and talking about it and I was like, yep. mm -hmm. I, amen to that, amen to that, because that this is what we need to start doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to I want to say, because I, I want to go back to the education side of this too, um, I hate the way other cultures are othered within Western classical music training. And it's so true that throughout music history, music theory, we're not really like, maybe there's one section on jazz, maybe, but you have to go out and if you want to actually find connections to your culture that's outside of like the Western canon, like to classical music, you have to do the your own work on yourself. So it's not like we're, we're just, we're not just learning about Mozart, Bach, Beethoven, that then we have to go out and find our people too, find our culture where it was, where it's been forgotten and overlooked. And I hate how it's also seen a lot of our like culture, the music we place is seen as either 
not serious music or it's not complex enough to be performed on main stages. It literally makes me so angry whenever I feel like I have to justify playing music from my culture on like degree recitals or in general. And ha the only way I can do it is if I compare it to Mozart or compare it to Beethoven or compare it to these other melodies that everyone's like, oh, this is this is the creme de la creme. This is the top of the top. That's the only way that it's allowed in those spaces is if they're compared to the normal pantheons that we have within classical music. Um, as an educator and as someone who you're always trying to bring in someone with you when you walk into these spaces and you're trying to open up your own curriculum to include you know other cultures and not in a way that's othering how have you seen that transition over time how have you even yourself tried to combat this you know ever since 2020 i do have to say that the music world have been doing a much better job at like getting rid of this uttering or uttering that type of music mm -hmm. um, and i'm so thankful to work at the place where i worked at because like we have this conversation daily with faculty and with our dean of like how can we expand what you know this western classical canon to make it more inclusive to be more like the the people that we teach because i teach at the university where i live Stockton, California is one of the most diverse cities in America. Mm. Wow. And so we have done such great strides with the faculty and just really thinking about the intention of like, why are we doing this repertoire and not just programming, you know, that one token mm. um, minority into it, but giving it with intention and not specifically have to like defy it as, oh, it's because they had this relationship with like divorce talk or something like, you know, cutting out that comparison because like music is music. Music is how you perform it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you can take, because here's the thing, a lot of the standards that we play on our giving instruments, it took that one person to perform it well, to make it like, oh, okay, this is how you're supposed to perform this. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, every piece of music that I study no matter if it's Bach no matter if it's Hellstork like I give it the same kind of intention mm -hmm. and pride and work with it and that's what I teach my students like it doesn't matter if you're just like oh I'm not really a fan of this this piece that I'm learning okay so let's let's make a connection let's make you a fan because here's the thing you're gonna have to make it a fan with your students and to provide that. But I do have to say, I really think, especially when I get to the age where I retired, that this won't, hopefully this won't still be a conversation that we're having. Um, yes. The seeing you guys, just all of you, with just like your degrees and like your, your work in universities, knowing that this is like the forefront of your mind and that you are continually to advocate it and talk about it and bring it into your performance and your or um, work and putting excellent work with that, that your students is gonna see it. And because that you're putting that kind of work, they won't see it as, oh, okay, it's because of tokenism. No, they're like, this is a great work. So it's really on us, us today as advocators to really get mm -hmm. into the mindset and said, no, I'm not gonna have this conversation of like, you know, I have to compare it to make it great. It's great on its own. And let me show you why. I don't even have to tell yes. you. You perform it and mm -hmm. show you why. Mm -hmm. And that's right. something I know I saw Anthony do. I know me and Lauren have talked about it. Like Anthony and like we, I think we've talked about this, like in the trumpet specific world, flute world and band world. The standards, there's a reason they're standards. Yes. Cool. But you can find those aspects in newer works, like still, you need to be aware of the standards because they might hop on an auditions list. You need to get in grad school so then you can shake up the world when you walk into the room. Like you need to get your place in the grad school so you need to know the standards. But like where we have certain like aspects that we want from these standards, you can find in newer works. And sometimes it's even harder in different realms or easier, whatever it is. But you can find those stylistic things or find like, oh, this is really hard to put with a pianist. So this piece has always been hard to put with a pianist, but it's a standard. Let's do it this piece instead so they have a new different set of skills. 
So it's not like I don't have to go play Hindemith Symphony B flat, or I don't have to play with my um, uh, young band Overture for Winds and Percussion by Charles Carter. I can find a newer work that still features every section of the band and still does this thing. And I think that's a big thing. Like you're saying, given every piece intention. And then another thing what we can do is like, okay, we were all taught these pieces like freshman year, first semester, pull out your Haydn trumpet concerto, please. And let's work on ornamentation and work on style, or let's pull out this um, rocking Kevin day piece and let's learn how to move your fingers. Cause that man writes a lot of notes. <laughs> and I know Anthony has some things with like public school and doing that. I mean, yeah, I, for when, when I was teaching and even now as a grad student and conducting uh, my own ensembles and like, especially right now, since it's the new semester, you got to come up with all the repertoire and things. And I'm looking at, okay, well, I could do this, but I also could do this over here that is by a composer who won 50 years ago, would have never been able to be here. And what about pieces that they've just done? The reason things become of our canon is because it's been done and it's been done over and over and over again. But there's so many new voices right now that is really putting out quality art, but nobody's playing it. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to play it. And one of my, one of my, I, I, I'm new in this profession, but I, I can't believe I'm saying this already. I've already commissioned three, four works already by new people that are of all types of ranges of people. And I'm like, that's what I want my career. When I am 65, 70, and I look back on my career, I want to say, you know, I helped champion new voices in the in this field. I've gotten their music out and I've helped them become something new. Because if nobody gives a chance, how how are we going to continue to grow? So, you know, I'm so glad that you said and giving intention. And for anybody that's listening to this, because I just want to speak on this, give the same intention. And if you are not of the culture of the piece, sometimes you're going to have to go a step further because mm -hmm. that is one step that you lack. Right. And if you were to perform a piece, if I were to perform a piece from, um, say, a Hispanic culture, Hispanic Latinx, that's not my culture, but I'm going to do my extra work to find, to say, okay, well, here's this, let me do this. And then find those things like, okay, well, that's in my culture too. So now it's personal for you. And now I have a better site for that. So that's an extra step, but I'm still giving the same type, uh, intent that I would do the rest of my, you know, canon that they make me do, you know, how that goes. But mm -hmm. still the intention is there. Mm -hmm. Just put that out there. No, I, I personally love that you added the whole thing of if this is not something of my culture, I have to take an extra step for it to make sense. Because like being black, if I play music by a black composer, like we have that shared identity in that sense that we're both black. And I understand a lot of the culture that comes with that and everything. But if I'm going to go play music from a different culture, I need to take the time to understand this composer, meaning I need to take time to understand that culture. And I think that with all the things that have been happening with 2020, there is certain change happening. Um, but that is the thing that I think is missing from most of these things is intentionality in the sense of like not just playing the piece. You can play whatever you want to, but if you don't have the same intention, if you actually, it can be more harmful just to play the piece and go, okay, I did it, check, like there it is. It's like, no, no, mm, now you missed it. <laughs> now you made it worse. So now yeah. you have to back even more, you know, to make it to to bring it back to what it was actually supposed to be. So with all this, because we talk a lot about this, about repertoire on here being all in our different uh, fields, and we always have to talk about intentionality behind it as well. We try not to talk about quality because that pisses me off when we start bringing up repertoire and then someone goes, is it of quality though? And I'm like, why do you why do you bring that? Like, why? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it just, it makes me so upset whenever, you know, again, like, I can't imagine someone saying like, because I've had so many friends, especially vocal friends who have wanted to do spirituals and different like music from their cultures on their recitals. And their professors are like, 
yeah, but like, is that enough? Or like, you know, I don't, I think it's too easy. Or I think it's this. And it's like, you just not only disrespected me, <laughs> but like all of my culture, like every single thing about it, every aspect of not seeing the complexity within that, as what you may consider a simple melody, but the years and years that go into it. it and so here's, this is my biggest thing. And this is the thing I still see within a lot of amazing professors doing the things that they're doing in a lot of amazing institutions is this understanding and intentionality that comes with the new changes that are happening. You can't just do the change and say you did it. You have, I wanna see it. I wanna see that you made an extra effort because just playing the piece is not enough, period. It's work. It is work. <laughs> have to work mm -hmm. and, it, and it takes quality work um and that's what I, I love seeing from you is that you the quality it's always there from your playing to your pre your presentations the quality is there and I'm sure that you um inspiring your students quality work so as now an educator how are you um, influencing your students to become this next generation? How are you getting them ready for this next generation of playing flutes, of do, being an educator? Um, how is that? I mean, I have to look, how I train people is like of my experience and giving them a new experience because for a lot of my students, I'm probably their first black professor. Mm -hmm. And like, I had that a lot. And so one thing I have to say about black women is that we're just so caring and like we go the extra mile. So you were saying how much, how much you admire the quality of my work because like from day one, just growing up and listening to my parents and like them giving me very strict role, like you have to be better. Like, you know, you can't just set a low bar. You have to set that high bar um, mm -hmm. for yourself. And so, for me, to help my student get to that quality is one, telling them that I believe in them, that they can get to that high quality. And that yes, it's hard, but life is hard. Life is, um, have so many turmoil, but just know um, that like, you know, sorry, I don't mean to get religious and I don't do with my, my students, but like, you know, being a preacher kid, like yeah. the Lord is not gonna put more on your soul than what you can bear. Amen. And so you can get Amen. over that. Um, and so just being there cheerleader saying like, yes, it's hard. You don't want to do it. Half the time when I get out of bed, I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. But just take yeah. a step back and think about where you would like to see yourself. Set like realistic goals for yourself, where you like to see yourself. And it, your goals can change, you know, you can do, but like have that grit, have that perseverance to see you can get past this. And then you can change something about it. But like, you're going to feel so much more gratitude and so much pride in yourself when you overcome something. Like um, if you have a big deadline to like do a thing and you're just like, oh my God, how am I going to get everything done? And you like, you know, set little tasks and stuff. And like, it could be like right on like the grind deadline of getting it done. But once you're getting done, that's the best like feeling of like relief and this accomplishment, like I have gotten that. Um, to date, like finishing my dissertation was the biggest hurdle uh, <laughs> that I completed. And I remember just like, and here's the thing, I love like my topic. I was so passionate about it, but like, you know, being on that grind, writing a dissertation, writing, researching is a lot. Um, and so I remember to this day, like once I submitted everything and I even like, um, presented it to my my committee members and like you know they passed me for like two weeks I would just like randomly cry for no reason and I knew it was because like I accomplished something that I like you know I was like okay God willing I will accomplish this and if I don't I gave it my all and so giving that like that's the best feeling in the world and so for me it's important for me to be my students advocate my students therapist because I mean we teachers I mean we are so many things we are like a, an additional therapist to our students um we are like their cheerleader we are their professor we are we're helping them hold themselves together 
And knowing that they have that extra person in their life that has it, or you might be the only person that in their life that actually give that to them. That's important. And I don't take that responsibility lightly. Like I really, I care about that because a big thing about me is I really do believe like one of my purpose on this, on this earth and why God, like, you know, mm -hmm. made me is so I can give blessings to others. Yeah. And that, that helped me create joy. And that helped, I don't, I don't know. To me, the biggest joy that I can get is to give other people joy. Mm -hmm. after And blessings because like it was given to me and I know how much that meant to me. Sorry, I feel like I did a big like loop-de-loop -loop around <laughs> this whole conversation. No, no, I think it was perfect exactly where you ended because I think so much we go through, especially with, within academia, we get so bogged down on the standards and the check boxes and the things that you have to do to get the degree, to get the bag, whatever, get the job. And so often we don't talk about why we're doing this in the first place. Why are we not, you know, doing in a completely different field, doing something that would stress us out less, um, <laughs> that would not make us pull all up here all the time. Like, why are we here? Why are we doing this? Especially as people who come from uh, minoritized communities, like we could be doing something way easier <laughs> than trying to get into this field and, and change it more than that. But we're doing it because we feel like we have a connection to it. We feel like we have a purpose within it. And I think for me, especially one of my new, like new year's resolutions is to like leave self doubt in the past, which these two know that it, especially going through undergrad, there was imposter syndrome. There was all these things of where I was like, I don't feel like I'm enough. I don't feel like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here. Like it's hard. And I think the thing that always grounds me is knowing that I do love what I'm doing. I love the idea of that I'm going to be able to inspire people the way that I have been inspired. I, at the end of the day, I could be doing whatever. I know that, but I'm here. And so that's, I think, for, especially from the educator standpoint, having educators who emphasize that aspect, that we are doing this together. We love doing what we're doing. And at the end of the day, you give it your all. And that's what you ask of yourself. You ask and you ask yourself, did you give it your all? Yes. Then you did exactly what you were supposed to do. That is all you can ask yourself. And so like that mindset and the idea of just connecting with people, bringing joy, bringing yourself joy and happiness should be the basis for everything that we do. And I love that we are circling back to that because you can get tangled in all the paperwork and what it, all these requirements and everything, but just go back to your roots, ask yourself why, and I think you'll find your answer. That's where you'll find your motivation. Truly. And I love that you you brought up like that imposter syndrome. One thing that I do a lot is like, I, I'm real. I, I don't sugarcoat it. Like I have imposter syndrome. I had that like, oh my God, from the start of playing, like I, I recognize that. I recognize that sometimes um, there are certain instances when I perform that I get performance anxiety. And so being real and talking about the feelings that we get because our students might think that we are these like superhumans. I'm just like, I am far from that. I have problems. I go see a therapist every week and see knows all of my, my trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm not afraid or to say that, like I go see a therapist or anything because like we, you know, we all, we need to talk about things and to recognize that like, this is a commonality that we have, but look, I have this problem. I, I see it. Um, I like journal about it. I recognize, I don't like, you know, hide that the feeling that like I get anxiety when I perform sometimes, or I feel like I'm like someone is going, I mean, for the longest time, I thought um, after I got my DMA degree, once it came in the mail, I was like, oh, they're going to like send me an email, like, oh, you didn't do something. So we have to take it back. Like, I know that's like a weird, like kind of mentality, but I had that and being honest and upfront with my students that like, you know, you are going to feel this way sometimes, but there's going to be light in that tunnel. You're, mm -hmm. you're going to feel amazing. You're going to like, that's worth it. So some of this like um, pain that you're feeling, or I don't want to say pain, but the like doubt that you're feeling, it is valid feel that doubt but just know that you're going to grow and from that doubt come growth okay 
growth is not a linear path going forward. No. Growth is, you know, there's going to be a brick wall there. And mm -hmm. like, you're going to have to think about, okay, I can't go over it. I can't go under it. Let me see what, you know, thinking about ways. And like, you know, if you fail at it, failure is really just, um, just winning success, but like, you know, growing more from that. So like, just know they're going to be failures. They're going to be like doubt in your life. And that's totally normal, but that doesn't define who you are. What defines yourself is like how you overcome that overcoming. And I think that's just a big thing that Southerners just have because that is just, it's just overcome so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And that's like what you, like the past couple of things you're talking about in that is like, I had a one one or a couple, a couple of my students like in uh, middle school and not middle school, high school and college one that has like self crippling doubt. They're like every time they touch the trumpet, they're like, "I just suck, I'm bad." I'm like, "Okay, so you can't say those words anymore. I'm gonna need you to be specific. Like you're generalizing everything. I'm gonna need you to tell me specifically why." And then they lose words. I'm like, "So." it's not as bad as you think you're just using these generalization words because you don't feel like it's your best. And we can always feel like we, half of us pick up our instrument and two out of 10 times, it's probably our best that we know for sure. Like, Oh yeah. Boom. The other eight times we, we got to work it up. We got to put some makeup on it, put a little stage makeup, do the hair and get everything done. It's just like, I'm in, um, one of the students it was their first semester of lessons. So I went all 12. And then at the end, I was like, look at your growth. But now the judgment you have every time you play the trumpet, I need you to take that away. I need you to analyze it mm -hmm. and not judge yourself about what you can do on a given day. You've accomplished so much over 12 lessons when you've never had lessons at all. So take that judgment away and bring in analyzation and you'll just, and it'll just like be this growth that is just like awesome. And you also won't say that you are a trumpet player. You are X and X who just happens to blow in plumbing to make money. Like that's just a, a trumpet player. You blow in plumbing. It's great. I'm a plumber. Sometimes I'm an air mover. Who knows? I, Anthony's a stick waver. He uses a stick. And sometimes it got good intonation, and sometimes that, where it at? Where it at? That, that, there's a stick. Stick it. Wave it. Wave it. There it is. And it's just like it's just like it's sometimes I like to just have fun with the kids and be like, y'all, I'm a plumber. I just make music with the plumbing. My best friend, she plays a stick. It goes this way. My other friend waves the stick. It's just like, no, we ain't got to take it so serious all the time. We do not have to accomplish everything in the musical repertoire and skill in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Have a life, please. Give yourself and time. Please. Give yourself time. Give yourself um, an uh, openness of your heart to have those failures because they're not failures, like you said. They're growth. Mm -hmm. So we have to, and I think the society tells us that, we have to be instantly great, uh, especially with social media. You have to be instantly great all the time. And you have to have a smile on your face. Life is not that way. And I and I think that goes to our Southern upbringing is our parents told us that when we were young, like you ain't always going to have good days. There are going to be some bad days. There are going to be some real rough days. But you are going to learn from all of this because it's all part of you. These are all of your experiences. That's what make you unique. So really dive into that. But it's been a pleasure. It, it's been a pleasure hearing your wisdom um, upon us and our audience, because like we need to see more of you and all the things that you are doing and your knowledge that you are giving. Uh, it, it is just amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. I mean, you all have just, been so great and I have thoroughly enjoyed this entire conversation oh my god we can go on for hours <laughs> <laughs> and honestly I would love like one of my biggest things is I love talking about teaching I love talking about what I do with intention or like you know that I I listen to my students and like I take that in and there's times that I'm just like 
awake at night and I'm just like, okay, that didn't go well in the lesson. Let me think about another way to like do that. Like I, I absolutely care about the things that I do. And that what's me like, I say it like I have the best life because I, I live with intentions and I make sure that I not only give myself happiness, but give other people happiness. So thank you three for giving me happiness. And I, I hope that whoever listening to this podcast, as you're soaking all of our words in, that it gives you happiness that you can go forth and give other people that happiness. I, I mean, that's, there's not a better way to say that, not a better way to to end so thank you re- truly from the bottom of all our hearts for for spending your your time with us and and giving your wisdom and knowledge and sharing that with our audience members as well because i'm sure there's so many people who anything we say just clicked for them and especially at this new year like everyone wants a fresh start everyone wants to feel like okay clean slate let's figure it out you know if there's things you're trying to figure out things you're trying to continue on things you're trying to finish up like use this use this energy and just first of all stay happy like take time for yourself show yourself grace show yourself mercy and just remember why you're doing it remember the why and so thank you for being here with us today we hope you all enjoyed this episode um we'll drop all the information and links to um britney's socials and whatever she wants to share with you all to find her and her um work and we'll be back next week with a new episode and more information and knowledge to drop on y'all so um thanks for being here with us and we'll see you next time happy new year happy new year